studies at the Institute of Sociology, and he will talk about the importance of recognizing difference, rethinking Central and East European environmentalism. Uh, the seminar will be recorded, but only for personal use of two people who were unable to take part in the seminar. I hope that you don't mind since the recording will not be shared publicly. Um, and also, since uh, it looks like uh, we might be quite many, I want to kindly ask you if you have any questions, please ask them in the chat and Petra Hlička will answer them in the second part of the seminar within the discussion. Thank you very much and the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Michaela, and good afternoon to everyone. And many thanks for joining me for today's talk. I'd like to thank the organizers of this seminar series for the invitation and for the opportunity to share with you the results of my cooperation with Sherstin Jakobsson from the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. This cooperation resulted in an eponymous paper that has just been published in Political Geography as an open access article. It happened last Friday. And one more thing to say at the beginning, I thought I should explain the Seskami stamp, you know, the red stamp on the slide. Seskami is a new research project and the acronym stands for the Center for the Study of Social Change and the Material Environment. At the moment, it's only a provisional logo, what you see, as we are in the, in the process of developing the project's website and logo. SESCAM is a five-year project based in the Institute of Sociology, and it's led by Slavomira Ferenczuhova with Peter Vashat, Terezia Lokšova, and myself as members of her team. The center will officially be launched on the 15th of June with an online talk by the Swiss geographer Martin Miller, to which you are cordially invited. So in a way, today's talk is a kind of prequel to this major event planned for, for June. I thought I should start with something fairly light. And this cartoon from the Estonian Daily Postimens captures really well what I want to talk about today. And that's how East European valuable and inspiring behaviors and practices, including those relevant to the environment, are read from the West. Let me read out the speech bubble. What are those East Europeans playing at over there? Are they so lazy that they can't even go to the food shop? The two guys on the right represent Western agro-food consultants that have been advising East European governments on how to modernize their societies and agriculture since 1990. And I think this attitude can easily be extended beyond the realm of policy to academia. Now, what's the goal of this talk? It seeks to reposition and reassess the value of the specificities of Central and East European environmentalism and to present these specificities as opportunities for the development of novel perspectives on environmental activism and behaviors and their adoption outside the Central East European region. Why is this important? Why it matters? We believe that in the context of the increasingly urgent search for alternative trajectories towards sustainability, it's becoming untenable to justify ignoring the specific features of Central East European environmentalism and to dismiss them as simply undeveloped. And this is how I will proceed to make that argument. I'll start by briefly locating the studies of Central East European environmentalism in wider academic debates. I will then proceed to outlining the generally low standing of social science knowledge from the European East in the hierarchy of knowledge production. Third, I will show how, despite the changing emphasis in the research on Central East European environmentalism, there has been no change in the assumption that knowledge obtained from studies conducted in the West is directly applicable to research in this region. Next and fourth, I'll show the inadequacy of this approach and how it precludes valuable lessons from Central East European environmentalism to be considered elsewhere beyond this region. Fifth, I'll then highlight several features of Central East European environmentalism that deserve wider considerations as they hold the promise of extending the range of approaches to addressing the environmental crisis in novel but often neglected directions. And I will wrap up with a brief summary of concluding remarks. And I think you will 
if you decide to stay with me, you will have to endure 44, 45 more minutes of this talk. An increasing number of works has begun to challenge the existing hierarchies in global knowledge production and raise the question, why has social science theorizations and political innovations for so long been expected to come from the West? And much of this work in sociology, anthropology, and human geography is concerned with inequalities in knowledge production and circulation on the axis between the global North and the global South. However, more recently, there has been an interest in urban geography and also agri-food studies in challenging Western dominance in knowledge production, also from the perspective of the European East. And this talk brings these debates to a research area which has so far, in my view, been neglected in these exchanges. It aims to problematize the dominant approach to research on post-1989 Central and East European environmentalism. And the article I mentioned earlier, and whose title you can see here, written with Chertin Jakobson, provides a basis and kind of spine for this talk. But I will also revisit several other articles I co-authored in the past as I go along, as they help me to develop my overall argument. Now, since the initial focus on the role of environmental dissent in bringing down communist regimes, scholarship on Central and East European environmentalism has diversified and undergone shifts in focus. However, the perspective from which has been, it has been studied has remained largely intact. On both sides of the former Iron Curtain, researchers have read the developments on, in environmental thought, activism and behaviors in Central and Eastern Europe from a Western perspective. And these comparisons with Western models have led to negatively connoted assessments equating Central and Eastern Europe with insufficiently developed forms of engagement in environmental matters. There's an assumption in the dominant literature that Western environmentalism represents a yardstick against which the Central East European variant should be assessed. In this logic, West European environmental attitudes constitute mainstream and a norm against which the degree of convergence or divergence of East European attitudes is assessed. And this underpins much of existing scholarship and policymaking and reifies the notion that knowledge generated in Western context is universally valid, while knowledge produced in the Central and East European region is only of local and limited importance. Now, in keeping with that point, I'd like to address the issue of the hierarchies in global knowledge production. Inspired by the post-colonial critique, we echo the call about the need to particularize Western experience and valorize the knowledge generated outside the West. In these debates, it's the global South where alternative knowledge is supposed to be produced. However, while the global North and global South have become established categories for thinking about global difference, Martin Miller highlighted the need for the category of the global East. For him, rather than a geographical location, Eastness is a liminal condition of in-betweenness not quite north, not quite south, as the east is too powerful to be a periphery, but too weak to be the center. I think this is the point when I need to issue a disclaimer to prevent possible misunderstandings. I want to make clear that we have no intention to set the west against the east. We don't deny the hugely influential western scholarship. Um, has had for understanding the causes of and possible responses to current environmental crisis. And we don't wish to romanticize Central and Eastern Europe as a beacon of environmentalism either. At the same time, however, we believe that the dramatic deepening of the environmental crisis demands the extension of the search for insights and inspiration beyond the Western core of knowledge production. And to achieve that, requires adoption of a more inclusive view of Central and East European environmentalism. This view should encompass not only political mobilization and organization on environmental matters, but also everyday practices. Such an inclusive definition is needed in our view because of Central and East European historical experiences. Informal rather than formal organizing may be 
the preferred choice there. And citizens may prefer to label what they do in non-political terms. And now a couple of words on the dominant account of Central East European environmentalism. Following Kasper um, Shuletsky and Yulia Shuletska, scholarship on modern Central East European environmentalism can be usefully divided into three types of literatures. A, sociological and historical accounts of pre-1989 environmental dissent. B, political science studies on civil society development in the 1990s and in the noughties, you know, the first decade of the century. And C, post-2000 transnational studies on the process of Europeanization of Central East European environmentalism related to the accession of these countries to the European Union. What's important for the argument of this talk is that in the literature since the mid noughties that means in the last 15 years or so, the focus on environmental civil society actors was combined with the promotion of ethical consumption as a preferred solution to environmental problems. And there was a tendency in all this literature to frame Central East European environmentalism as lacking and, behind, and being insufficiently developed. And we speculate that one of the reasons for that might be, or might have been, the prominent role of political science in these analyses. According to the British sociologist Michael Buravoy, political science is a discipline that is concerned with the state and the political order and normatively tends to privilege Western democracy. With the benefit of hindsight, we can see that analysis by Western observers of Central East European environmentalism that were later followed by analysis of their counterparts from the region were implicitly or explicitly based on the modernization thesis and assessed Central East European environmentalism on Western terms. And the underlying criterion was the degree to which Central East European environmentalism conformed with or diverged from what they considered an ideal Western model. Now, this is what the British geographer and my former colleague Doreen Massey criticized as the tendency in modernization discourses to conceptualize contemporaneous differences as a temporal sequence. The multiplicities of the spatial have been rendered as merely stages in the temporal queue, she wrote in 2005. As a consequence, there is only one linear story of modernity in which the advanced societies, in this case, West European, lead and others, in this case, East European, follow. The implication is that the future is foretold. This understanding of modernity denies the possibility of multiple tra trajectories. The future is not open. Now the tendency to use Western models as benchmarks for Central East European environmentalism was most pronounced in the literature on Europeanization. In the environmental field, it was concerned with compliance of environmental actors and processes in Central East Europe with West European models. Central East European actors were expected to change not only their strategies and interests, but also their preferences, beliefs, and expectations. So it was really a very profound change. It was expected and in fact demanded. And what's important here are the prevailing types of environmental behavior that are used to assess Central East European environmentalism. And these include environmental group membership, signing petitions, financial donations, and participation in protests. In brief, these are participatory behaviors associated with environmentalism in affluent uh, Western democracies. Based on these criteria, assessment of post-2000 environmentalism in Central East Europe were fairly negative. Let me quote one of these authors. Historically, low levels of civic engagement in voluntary organizations contrasted unfavorably with the vibrant civic landscape, landscapes of Western Europe and North America. Following this line of argument, Audrone Kelesiene and Aiste Balzekiene found that the percentage, sorry, the average percentage of East European populations involved in environmental behaviors in the public sphere, such as environmental group membership, petition signing, protest, was less than half, 5%. The average in, in West European and Nordic countries, where it was nearly 13%. And this is shown in the table on the next 
slide. Some observers highlighted the disinclination of Central and East European populations to engage in forms of collective action and organizational membership. For example, Tsveta Petrova and Sidney Tarov compiled a long list of East European sins. Central and East European citizens' capacity for environmental collective action was deemed to be low because of the weakening, demobilization, and even the disintegration of civil society, the increasing political apathy of post-socialist citizens and radical or egoistic individualism, social anomies, amoral cynicism, and paternalism. I mean, it would be really difficult to imagine a more damning denouncement of these hopeless East Europeans. And now I want to start problematizing these essentializing assessments of the unsatisfactory performance of Central East European environmental activism and its decline. Including problematization of the location of its causes in the legacy of the proscription against organized activism during the communist era and a result of economic underdevelopment. This economically deterministic understanding of environmental concern is deeply problematic and has been subject to criticism because it assumes, in accordance with the post materialist thesis, that environmental concern only arises once society has reached a certain level of development in wealth and hence also a high level of environmental destruction. There are, outside the region of Eastern Europe, plenty of alternative forms of environmentalism that are deemed inspiring and important, and they include environmentalism of the poor, third world environmentalism in the global south, and the environmental justice movement uh, among marginalized communities in the global north. However, when it came to Central and East European environmentalism, the dominant school of thought did not consider, at least not for a long time, the possibility of it being of a specific and potentially inspiring variety of environmentalism. And the region has been, has been expected to conform to the type of development foregrounded by the West and associated with post-materialist environmentalism. It was considered only a matter of time before it develops in a very similar way. And now I want to use uh, the case of the import of ethical consumption in Central and Eastern Europe as an example of the adoption of Western models to illustrate the risks associated with the ignorance of the context in which the important model or initiative innovation arrives and the tendency to disregard the effects of this import on vernacular or domestic, if you like, environmental practices in Central Eastern Europe and the marginalization in favor of Western style models. And what's important to say is that research and public policy on sustainable development in Eastern Europe after the year 2000 copied or followed the developments in the West and hence also focused on environmental citizenship and the related concept of sustainable consumption. In terms of historical context, from 1994, the European Union's policies in relation to sustainable consumption were developed in parallel with initiatives of the United Nations and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, through a series of international conferences championing the concept of sustainable consumption. And there was a twofold impetus in Central and Eastern Europe for focusing on sustainable consumption in the mid noughties in other words, 15 years ago, roughly 15 years ago. A, it was the European Commission's emphasis on sustainable consumption as one of the key priorities for the EU to achieve sustainable development in the follow-up to the World Summit on Sustainable Development held in Johannesburg in 2002, and B, the extension of this strategy to achieve sustainable development in Central and East European countries during the process of their accession to the European Union, in other words, their Europeanization. What do I mean by sustainable consumption? It is a strategy to achieving sustainable development that's based on the use of market instruments of environmental policy to shift consumption patterns towards greater eco-efficiency. And it is meant to be achieved either through the reduction of resource use per consumption unit or by environmentally friendly design. These efficiency gains rest on an assumption that individual consumers' behavior is steered by things like 
product labeling, consumer education, and environmental taxation, and that these in turn drive market transformations towards the provision of environmentally less damaging goods and services. And I just want to draw your attention to this green box in, 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 on this slide, which summarizes what the British sociologist Elizabeth Schoff calls the ABC model of public policy, which is meant to uh, secure this process I've just described. And in this ABC, the A st stands for attitudes that are supposed to drive B behaviors that individuals choose, that's the C they choose to adopt. A perfect example of the import of sustainable consumption uh, in the early first decade of the century was the UNEP RAM seminar under the title Sustainable Consumption Opportunities for Europe, Scope for Sure. And of course, UNEP is the United Nations Environmental Program. The UNEP organized a series of these seminars for civil society actors in a range of Central East European countries. In Czechia, the seminar was held on the 29th and 30th of May, 2003 in Prague. So we are forever able to put an exact date on the arrival of sustainable consumption as a concept in this country. And after the seminar, Czech environmental groups were expected to embark on a series of initiatives aimed at dissemination of information to enhance the capacity of consumers to make the correct environmentally desirable choices. And these initiatives included campaigns promoting eco-labels and establishing online calculators of ecological footprints. In practice, the 2003 seminar introduced what soon became an established approach to sustainable food consumption. And these were market-based schemes relying on ethically behaving environmental citizens, such as in organic and fair trade certifications. In addition to media promotion and educational campaigns in support of sustainable consumption, many Czech environmental NGOs started selling organic and fair trade food from their offices and headquarters. But I'd like to put it in a wider perspective. Three years after the SCOPE seminar, the annual expenditure on fair trade products was only 5 million Czech crowns in this country and only a tiny fraction, much less than 1%, of food sold in Czechia was organically certified. At the same time, this minuscule scale of ethically marketed certified food relying on citizens' environmentally responsible choices contrasted with the widespread and well-established non-market food practices that were compatible with the principle of sustainable development. And here's an example of what I mean. In Czechia, for example, 20% 20% of all vegetables, fruit, and potatoes grown in the temperate zone, and also eggs consumed in this country by Czech households were either directly produced by the households themselves or received as a gift from another household. And these practices, homegrown food, food foraging, you know, picking berries and mushrooms, for example, and sharing this food were completely ignored in campaigns by all protagonists of sustainable consumption. And uh, at the same time, as we now know, uh, nearly 50% of this food is produced in what I would call organically non-certified way. Now, Evelyn De Hope and I explored the relationship of Czech NGO activists with homegrown food in our 2017 article published in Local Environment. And we found that these activists had a mixed and ambiguous attitude to homegrown food while they enjoyed eating it, because they were all receiving it from relatives and parents living in the countryside, they found it difficult to campaign on it. In their private life, they were perfectly okay with it, while in their professional life, they did not see how this would provide an opportunity to promote this as an innovation. It was also impossible to find funding for such a campaign. We also looked at the coverage of food alternatives, you know, what was presented or framed as food alternatives in Sedma Generace, which is a magazine of the Czech branch of Friends of the Earth called Hanuti Duha. And we discovered that what constitutes food alternatives really changed. Up until 2003, articles on traditional smallholding and gardening prevailed 
in terms of what this magazine portrayed as alternative food. But after 2004, which was a year after the SCOPE seminar held in Prague, imported food alternatives like fair trade and organic food began to dominate the coverage in the magazine. What is the lesson of this case study? We would argue that the importation of sustainable consumption governance into Central East Europe had an ambiguous effect. On the one hand, it was a source of policy innovation and an extension of opportunities for sustainable food consumption in the region. On the other hand, and more broadly beyond food consumption, you know, sustainable consumption in general. On the other hand, it also resulted in the establishment of a dominant discourse on sustainable consumption, which championed a marginal form of sustainable consumption. And it disregarded the well-established everyday food practices, which produced large volumes of food and in which a sizable segment of the population, about 40% in other countries is more than that, participated, as I will show in a minute. And we believe that the inclusion of these overlooked forms of environmentalism are important for scholarship on sustainable futures. And I'll return to this point briefly in the conclusion. Now I want to talk about an alternative account of Central European environmentalism, what we propose, you know, how we should look at it. Now, let me start this part of the talk with a wider point. After 1990, the emphasis on building civil society was part of the reform ideology and was one reason for the privatization of new post-1989 civil society organizations over associations and practices inherited from socialist times. And a similar logic operated in the environmental sphere where long-standing environmental organizations and activities that originated in the socialist period were neglected by researchers. We would argue that if we want to learn something new from Central Eastern Europe, rather than reading Central East European environmentalism from a Western perspective and lamenting the absence of underdevelopment of post-materialism in the region as the basis of environmentalism, we should start looking at domestic development while being aware of the long-term interactions with the West that occurred during and before the, pre the, the preceding socialist period. We should take seriously, I think, Sick and Anderson's point about, this is specifically about Green parties, but I think it has wider relevance. When they said that we may be trying too hard when researching Central East European Green parties, to find evidence of post-materialism for the sheer reason that this, has, this was behind the advent of West European Green parties. In other words, they are inviting us to think about this differently, you know, not to follow the established model. And if we want to do this, I think there are two points we should bear in mind. First, Zsuzsa Gile drew attention to the tensions between the Central and East European tradition of anti-politics and the imported model of participatory politics. According to this thesis, Central East European environmentalism has been strongly influenced by the pre-1989 value placed on authenticity, personal ethics, skepticism, and the stigmatization of social visions that are imposed on society from above. And those, the socialist times experience of being in a constant state of mobilization imposed from above made large sections of society wary of activist campaigning. Externally promoted forms of Western political participation were ignorant of these domestic traditions of anti-politics. And I think this partly explains the reluctance to embrace participation, political activism, and identity politics in post-1989 Central Eastern Europe. Now, the second point is that there might be some deeper but unobvious structural reasons for the difference of environmentalism in Central Eastern Europe. The presence or absence of post-materialism could be a manifestation of these structural differences. In the 1999 article published of all journals in Czech Sociological Review, I speculated on the importance of the different class system and much more promisingly, I think, of different educational structures and experiences of Central and East European populations compared to the West. So here you will probably spot the caveat here. Because while I'm very proud of this ancient article, I have to confess that it was to a large extent written from the perspective I'm slightly critical of today. And now I will share with you a couple of slides 
um, with information that's equivalent to what I would call sociological archaeology. In the early 1990s, I wanted to understand why environmental concern and mobilization so strong in some sense Europe before and during the 1989 changes evaporated so quickly after 1989. And to that end, I compared British and Czech Greens and environmental group members by asking Czechs the same questions other researchers asked previously in the United Kingdom. And it turned out that British and Czech Greens were two completely different groups of people. They had nothing in common. Members of environmental groups were much more similar. They were both, in both cases, highly educated. They had similar jobs in the public sector and so on. But even there, there were two major differences, and that was the educational background and, of course, political orientation. British environmentalist educational background was in the social sciences, arts and humanities, which is associated with an emphasis on democratic participation, social justice, and the interconnectedness of environmental and social issues, according to some academic accounts. And in contrast, Czech environmentalist educational profile was, as you guess, dominated by science and technology. And of course, politically, they were much more right-wing than the Brits. Now, I want to apologize for this self-promotion, but this article co-authored with Joe Smith some time ago seeks to bring to the fore the blend of science and romantic undercurrents in modern Czech environmentalism. And I think we would find similar things in Poland, for example. In the second half of the 20th century, let me read out the title, Out of the Woods and Into the Lab, Exploring the Strange Marriage of American Woodcraft and Soviet Ecology in Czech Environmentalism. This article shows how the history of modern Czech environmentalism goes back to, the 19, to 1957, when Otakar Leski founded JIS, you know, the first organization in, in Czechoslovakia. It's an organization that was fairly independent of the regime, received no funding from it, and managed to survive over 20 years until 1979, despite the regime's hostility towards it. And that what's really forgotten now is that it had about 10,000 children and teenagers as its members. And this slide is meant to show that the ranking of environmental problems in terms of their importance, according to Czech Greens, was a reverse of the ranking of these problems by the British Greens. For Czechs, local, local environmental problems were deemed to be the most pressing. For the British, it was global environmental problems. And here, uh, the least important issues for Czechs were the most important ones for the British. So we could argue that Czechs were more concerned with everyday problems that were uh, that more immediately affect their life. Problems that are more local, less abstract, and also more directly related to human health, like food and drinking water quality and protection of the countryside. And I would speculate that these attitudes have in some form, to some extent, persisted today. <clears throat> now, we contend that we should not um, be dismissive of these attitudes simply because they differ from the West. We believe there is a lot to explore and learn from in the quest for developing more diverse approaches to dealing with the environmental crisis. The dominant account of Central East European environmentalism tends to overlook these traditional forms of envir environmental behaviors, which include participation in nature conservation brigades, the volunteer groups, formal and informal outdoor education, and everyday sustainable practices and lifestyles, including voluntary simplicity and downsizing. And the latter two are fairly radical forms of sustainable consumption. Now, let me repeat, we don't want to deny that there are differences in the level of civic environmental mobilization between Western and Central Eastern Europe. Instead, 
we would, we would say that a lower level of environmental civic engagement may be one feature of this difference. What's important is that alongside the dissident style environmental politics emphasizing civic engagement, Central and Eastern Europe harbored a tradition of a strong but often invisible strands of non-political and everyday environmentalism. Uh, let me give you an example of this. There is, in Western societies, an acutely felt crisis of children losing touch with nature and of the consequences of this for the future of nature conservation. And these include the loss of a feeling for nature and ecosystems and a decrease in environmental activism more generally. You know, where will the next generation of environmental activists come from when children are not, no longer interested in it? In Czechia and Slovakia, environmental activism was historically underpinned by cultural undercurrents that extolled the virtues of the direct experience of pristine, what they call pristine nature, including its character building potential and the development of practical outdoor skills. In the Czech context, movement Brontosaurus and similar organizations in Poland and Slovakia often, that often operate under the radar, radar are examples of this. And this gave rise to the long-standing conviction in Central East Europe that education about and in nature is crucial for individual betterment and that learning an environmentally positive lifestyle at a young age is an effective way to transform the relationship between society and the environment. And just think back to the out of the woods and into, lab, into the lab article I mentioned a minute ago. That's exactly what we talk about in, in that article. Some Central and East European countries have systems of ecological education for children and youth that function outside, but in interaction with the formal school system. In Czechia, there is a network of over 90 centers of ecological education, which offers hundreds of education environmental programs aimed at school children and teachers. And most of them also provide after school, often outdoor activities for children as well as education for the public. And similarly in Poland, there's an organization called Group Gaia, which was established already in the 1980s and performs similar functions and collaborates with schools, provides educational materials and also on the ground nature experiences. These traditional and well-established features of Central East European society, such as hands-on education, contact with nature via brigades, have far-reaching effects. For example, imported food innovations such as farmers markets, community supported agriculture, community gardening and so on, have found fertile ground in this region. They built on the already well-established and widespread food supply chain practices of household food provisioning, you know, food produced by households. Importantly, Central East European food self-provisioning is a socially diverse an inclusive practice that people from all education class and occupation backgrounds engage in. And here I want to show the differences in the prevalence of household food production in Europe. The chart on the left shows the percentage of the population in West European, South European and East European countries engaged in home food production. So we can see a considerable difference between the 10% on, on average of you know, West European populations engaged in these practices and the 40% average in Eastern Europe. Another really important feature of Central East European societies is that they produce much less waste than West European societies. The chart on the left shows that East European societies generate considerably less municipal waste per capita than the EU average. And the chart on the right indicates that as far as total food waste per capita is concerned, you know, food from the whole food chain, Central East European societies again are well below the EU average of 173 kilograms of food waste per person per year. You can see this is a small fraction of that average in the countries in Eastern Europe, which is the bottom of the chart. An ongoing research project at Mendel University in Brno about food waste generated by household, households shows that Czech households produce 41% of food waste compared to the EU average. 
and if I'm to put a figure on it, it's 37 and a half kilogram per year compared to 92 kilograms per person per year. These are very reliable findings based on the sample of 900 urban and hence fairly affluent Brno households, not urban households. So clearly in the Central East European region, there are many important lessons on everyday sustainability that other European societies and also researchers might find inspiring and useful. And I think what we also need to bear in mind when we discuss these things is the value action cap. As many investigations discovered, people hold, holding environmental values do not necessarily cause less environmental harm. And I use here just one example of that in terms of um, a paper by Jan Vavra and Rosa Plapka, which shows how carbon footprint of people holding views sensitive to risks of climate change is not different to the footprint of people who don't care about climate change. You know, there's no difference. And I think we would find a lot of articles which would kind of make this point even more in a more general way. And now let me go to the conclusion and make a couple of concluding remarks. Now, for a long time, the idea that Central and Eastern Europe would be a source of critique and theory seemed untenable and even unthinkable. Inspired by post-colonial approaches to um, and by the recognition in academia of the importance of non-Western environmentalisms, we have argued that there is a strong case to challenge the dominant account of Central and East European environmentalism and to promote an alternative account that acknowledges its potential. In this talk, I've argued for the need to diversify the responses to the deepening environmental crisis and adopted the geographical perspective of multiple trajectories towards modernity. Need to interrogate existing hierarchies of the global rich production on environmentalism. Need to propose an alternative reading of Central and East European environmentalism, not just as an undeveloped inadequate variant of Western model of environmentalism, but something similar to what Schlossberg and Coase call new environmentalism of everyday life as a move from the notion of post-materialist politics into a sustainable materialist focus on collective practices and institutions of provision of the basic needs of everyday life in terms of flows of power and materials through the body and community. So we can think of Central East European environmentalism as a distinct variant that offers novel insights that should be included in international circuits of knowledge production and communication. Central East Europe can be viewed as a home to a variety of informal and formal outdoor and nature-based educational initiatives aimed at promoting everyday pro-environmental behaviors. An example of these locally embedded everyday low impact practice-based forms of Central East European environmentalism are, as I mentioned, low rates of food waste, large volumes of homegrown and non-certified organic food, nature conservation brigades, informal education. These are all driven by a desire for authenticity, ethical living and personal integrity, rather than politicization and goal-oriented teleological motivations. And if we look at Central East European environmentalism in the way proposed in this talk, it invites us to think about sustainability in novel ways, to go beyond intentionality of sustainable behavior, to include sustainability by outcome rather than intention, to extend the notion of sustainability beyond those based on constraints and limitations, and therefore to include sustainable behaviors that are associated with enjoyment, pleasure, and exuberance. And very importantly, I think we usually think of sustainability as an outcome of developing something new, creative, innovative, and driven by technology. And I would argue that we should start considering the implications of possible losses of already existing everyday forms of sustainability. And just to give you an example, what would be the outcomes if millions of East Europeans cease to grow and share homegrown food? You can probably easily guess there will be greater marketization, longer food supply chains, with all the attendant environmental impacts. So for environmental NGOs in this region and elsewhere, I think it would be really important to start thinking about possibilities 
how to develop campaigns aimed at preventing these lawsuits. And that was really the final point I wanted to make and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you.